Good morning. Um, today we celebrate the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is peace. Nothing is impossible with God. Luke 137. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Luke 2.9. Today we light the fourth candle, the candle of peace. There is yet another gift to unwrap under the tree. And by the tree, we must envision not only the evergreen, but also the tree of Christ's cross. For under both trees is this tender, joyous gift, peace. As we begin to unwrap this gift, we may think of peace as a sense of tranquility. But the gift of peace means so much more. The Hebrew word for peace, which is used here also by Jesus, is shalom. Shalom means wholeness, well-being, well health, forgiveness, right relationships. This shalom comes in the midst of judgment and hostility, but Jesus does not back away from the power of his peace that he offers. This is my peace that I give to you, he says. My peace, he says, is a gift that promises there is no longer any hostility between God and humanity, but the fullness of wholeness, forgiveness, and righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our spirits and in all our lives, O Lord, fill us with your peace. Amen. At you can stay right up here, Christian. You'll be first on the spot. I'm taking that one. Okay, you can that one. Yeah. I understand. Good morning. Oh, the rest of you must be asleep. Are you asleep? It's kind of one of those days where it would be pretty easy to be asleep with it foggy and a little rainy and all those kind of things. How many days until Christmas? Seven. Yeah. And what happens on Christmas? Tell me. You get presents, you're right. Why do we get presents? Darren, I heard you say it's Jesus' birthday. Yeah, we get presents because of Christmas. And the greatest gift of all is Jesus. He has come to save us. He has come to be our Savior. And it's a wonderful thing. And one of the reasons why we give and receive gifts at Christmas is because we remember that Jesus has come. And there were these wise men who came, sometimes from a great distance, and they came to worship Jesus. And what did they bring when they came to worship Jesus? Gold, mm -hmm. and frankincense, and myrrh. They brought three gifts to Jesus. Now, do you just get three gifts? No, sometimes we get more than three gifts, don't we? Twenty. Oh my, I'm going to come to your house. But giving and receiving gifts is a very special part of Christmas. And every time that we give and receive a gift, we should remember and be thankful for the perfect gift which has come. And that is Jesus who has come to be our Savior and our Lord. In this wonderful time of the year, we get caught up in so many things. Singing Christmas carols, singing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, dancing in the aisle during... <laughs> Praise and worship time. The rest of you are welcome to join her anytime you want, by the way. It's perfectly fine by me. And it's a wonderful time for us, but let's always remember why we celebrate Christmas. Do you know what the word Christmas means? Hmm. Wonder if anyone out there knows what the word Christmas means. It literally means to worship Christ. And so Christmas is all about worshiping Christ. Remembering that he is our Savior and our Lord and that we might bow before him and worship him as well. Let me pray with you.
Heavenly Father, we know that Christmas is just seven days away and we're so excited. And we are so grateful for the gifts that you have given, for the blessings that you have bestowed. We ask that you would bless and be with the children in the next week until Christmas comes and we will have a time of great joy. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now before you leave, I hope that you're here next Sunday morning on Christmas Day. And when you come next Sunday morning, I'd ask you to bring one of your toys that you would get for Christmas. Bring your toy with you, and we're going to have a special prayer blessing for the gifts that you have received on Christmas. So just bring one, and the one will represent all the other things that you have gotten. So bring that next Sunday. Okay, you may return to your seats. If you have your Bible today, I'm going to invite you to turn to the book of Micah. Micah is a book of the Bible that perhaps we don't read very often from. It's sometimes called one of the minor prophets. It's minor only in the volume of material that is written, not minor in its importance. Micah is a prophet of God who served the Lord about 700 years before Jesus was born. He is the contemporary of Isaiah and would have seen and understood the prophecies of Isaiah as well. If you have your Bible, turn there to Micah chapter 5, and we'll be reading actually verses 2 through 5a, I guess is what, what you might want to say. The first phrase in, in, in verse 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites." He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live security, securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. The word Micah itself literally means a servant of God. And that's what Micah's desire is. And that should be all of our desires. To serve God in whatever way God has called you to do. And please understand that God calls people to serve him in all manners of vocations and professions. He doesn't just ask people to serve him as pastors or evangelists or missionaries, although they are important. He also wants people to serve in every occupation that we, you and I can imagine. And in our families, as moms and dads and children, grandparents, aunts and uncles, all of those kinds of things, all of those responsibilities are a way in which we serve the Lord. And Micah is an example to us of someone who serves God. Micah is writing this prophecy, and he doesn't have nearly the volume of material as does Isaiah. I spoke about Isaiah just a couple weeks back, and I reminded you that Isaiah is kind of the Bible in miniature, if you will. 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, 66 books in the Bible. Because Micah only has a small volume of material, we, we lump him in with, with a group of others who also have written only a small volume of material, and we call them minor prophets. And I think in some respects, we do them a great disservice when we call them a minor prophets. Because what they have to say is important. The volume of their material is not the issue for us. Uh, let me ask you a question. Would you sooner hear a five-hour sermon or a 15-minute sermon? Well, I think we probably know the answer to that. Unfortunately, you're getting the five-hour version today. <laughs> We'd sooner have the 
smaller amount of material that we can comprehend and digest in one sitting rather than the voluminous amount of material that perhaps would become overwhelming for us. We would begin to kind of lose track of ourselves or you would begin to have physical needs. You may need to get up and go out to the men's or ladies room or you may get hungry after a point in time if we were doing this for five hours at a time. So the volume of material is not the essence here. The importance of what is being said. And Micah gives us this prophecy about the one who is to come. The Christ who is to come. For many, many years, when I would be asked the question, what do you want for Christmas? My traditional answer was, peace on earth. And it still is a, a good answer. Peace on earth. And peace on earth can come and will come. But it's not going to necessarily come quickly. And it's not going to necessarily come without conflict. But peace, as scripture defines peace, the shalom that you heard about a little earlier this morning, is not an absence of war. Peace is the presence of God. When you have the Lord in your life, when you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, you can be at peace. No matter what your outward circumstances might be. I have never had the privilege of serving in our nation's military. Thought about it on a number of occasions and have second-guessed myself on a few occasions about it, but I've never done that. But having known lots of men and women who have served and who are serving today, I know that when Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord, you can still have peace in spite of chaotic circumstances. I have a godson who's a police officer over right outside of Reading, Pennsylvania. His first week on the job, he was involved in a shooting. There are many police officers who serve 30 years in retire and have never pulled their gun from their holster. Praise God for that. How about? My godson pulls his revolver and shoots somebody the first week on the job. And as I spoke to him after that happened, I said, how did you feel? And he said, well, to be honest with you, it kind of just happened so quickly, you don't have time to feel. But he said, in reflection, I realized it's what I needed to do and what I had to do. And there was a sense of peace for me. The presence of God brings peace peace in spite of chaotic circumstance. Now when Micah writes this prophecy, Israel as we know it is about to come to an end. Israel, the, the ten tribes of the north, have already disappeared. What are left are two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. The southern tribes. And they're about to fall. It's 700 years before the birth of Christ and by 587, 586 B.C., some 120 years later, 115 years later, Jerusalem falls and the temple is destroyed. The northern kingdom is gone. There has been the great diaspora, the dispersion of the Jews. They have been carried off into Babylon. The Babylonian captivity has taken place for a lot of that northern kingdom already. And they never return. The ten lost tribes of Israel. Occasionally you'll see a special on A&E or the History Channel or whatever. Talk about the, the lost people of Israel. Those are the ten tribes that disappear never to return. But they will. And that's a part of Micah's prophecy here for us today as well. They will return. God is faithful. 
even at times when we do not see his hand at work in the way in which we want it to work, God is faithful. His promise to us is he will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus is the only person who can truly ever say he is God forsaken. And the moment of God forsakenness for Jesus happens when he is on the cross. When the sky turns dark because God has turned his back on his only begotten son because Jesus is taking the sin of the world upon himself and Jesus cries out those great words from Psalm 22 Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani My God, my God Why hast thou forsaken me? Many people have forsaken God God has forsaken no one. He has come that we might have peace. But peace comes at a cost. And the cost is the blood of Jesus Christ shed upon the cross. And then the promise for us is realized. Salvation has come, not just for the Jews in Jerusalem, not just for the people inside the temple. Jesus is crucified not inside the temple, not inside the Holy of Holies that was built by man, but he's crucified right outside of the city gates, right out there where everybody can see him. When the public can ridicule him or worship him, their choice and he dies upon that cross and at that moment the veil in the temple that separates the most holy place from the rest of the sanctuary is torn in two from top to bottom God is no longer accessed in this private place but instead in this public place he has come to bring peace Micah gives us these words of prophecy. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. This prophecy is twofold. It is speaking, first of all, of the birth of Jesus Christ, which is to come. Micah is 700 years before Jesus is born. But he is anticipating it as if it's today. And so should we. He is waiting for the consolation of Israel to happen. He is waiting for the Messiah to be born. And so should we. Be in an attitude of waiting and ready for that to come. But then he tells us that Israel will not see its consolation until the brothers return. And so in this prophecy, we see not only the birth of Jesus foretold, but we see the return of Jesus foretold. In Advent, we celebrate two meanings of that word. One is that he has come, the baby born in Bethlehem. And the second is that he's coming again. This time, perhaps to do what Israel thought he was going to do the first time. There were many who missed Jesus because they expected him to be the warrior king. To come and to overthrow Rome and to overthrow the government and, and to do all of those kinds of things that they were hoping and desiring would take place. But that's not why Jesus has come the first time. He has come the first time to establish himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Messiah. The Savior. He will come the second time bearing the sword and the book of Revelation tells us that this sword will proceed out of his mouth and it is the word of God the sword that is able to divide soul and spirit is able to separate us 
He will establish his throne and his kingdom forever. And Micah speaks of both of these in this passage of scripture. And you know, sometimes people will be united because of who Jesus is. And sometimes people will be divided because of who Jesus is. There is great joy in being a part of the church. When we have trusted Jesus to be Savior and Lord of our life, we join a family. That's not just this congregation, but of all true believers throughout the world. You and I have brothers and sisters in the kingdom that we will never see or know of until the day we see them in glory. Some of them will look like us and many of them will not. Some of them will worship like us and many of them will not. But the sword of the Spirit of the Lord also comes to divide. And Jesus tells us the two will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left behind. Someone will be plowing and taken up and someone else will be left behind. Because Jesus has come to be Savior. And many people in this world know the baby of Bethlehem. But do not know the Christ of Calvary. These two moments are inseparably linked for us. We are here on this day, Sunday. Why? Because it's the day of resurrection. The scripture is very clear about that. Jesus has been crucified, he's been put into the tomb and the women go to the tomb, and the scripture is clear, on the first day of the week, Sunday. And many in the Christian church have worshipped on Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus taking place on Sunday. And so we're here today to celebrate the resurrection. But we would not celebrate the resurrection if it were not for the birth of Jesus. And we would not celebrate the birth of Jesus if it were not for the resurrection. These two stories are inseparably linked for us. And so we are here also today for two purposes. To remember the prophecy that Jesus is coming. And he has. And to remember the prophecy that Jesus is coming, and he is. And he's coming to bring peace. Peace. Yesterday in our home, B and I had a very quiet day. It had snowed and sleeted and freezing rain and all of those kinds of things and we didn't need to go anywhere. The driveway was iced and snowed over and it still is as far as I'm concerned. I didn't do anything about it. I thought the Lord brought it, he'll take it away. <laughs> <laughs> We were at home all day. The telephone didn't really ring. I made a few phone calls to check on a few people and those kind of things. I'm sure B did as well. It was just a peaceful day. There were a lot of things I should have done yesterday. Should have gone over to the shop and finished up a few Christmas gifts that I've been working on. That didn't do it. 
should have wrapped a few packages. She was paying too close of attention. Didn't do that either. It was a day of peace. Don't you just love a day like that? Don't you just, can't you just wait for a day when you can just enjoy the day? Rather than being worried about running to this and running to that and doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. And all of those kinds of things. Jesus has come to give you peace in your heart through faith in him. And peace to the world who trusts him. Bethlehem is nowhere. If you and I were picking this story, if you and I were writing the script, Jesus would have been born right there in the middle of the temple. We'd have had media coverage. The Jerusalem Post would have been there. Covering this story. Not some sleepy little town of Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph, who are originally from Nazareth, traveled to Bethlehem because Quirinius is following the order of Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken. I think God protecting Mary in this. Now you and I think, well, what kind of protection is that? Traveling that great distance from the Galilee down to Jerusalem when you're ready to deliver a child. She doesn't have to listen to all the neighbors anymore. Because you can just imagine what those stories must have been like. Jesus comes in this little town of Bethlehem because he is of the house and lineage of David and because David had been promised that from your tribe will come one who will rule Israel forever. God is always faithful to his promise. And here's his promise for you. Trust in me. Believe in me. And I will give you eternal life. That's his promise. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that Jesus has come and that he is coming again. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we are people who are seeking peace. Peace in the busyness of our lives, but more importantly than that, peace in our relationship with you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would come and deliver us from our own selves. And grant us peace that comes in relationship with you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.